Good afternoon. I call to order the July 19th, 2023 meeting of the Local Agency Formation Commission at 2.30. We are meeting in the San Mateo County Board Chambers and uh, as well as on Zoom. At this point, the clerk will explain how both written and spoken comments can be made by attendees of the meeting, whether in person or in Zoom. Thank you, Madam Chair. For members of the public, the instructions of how to participate in today's meeting may be found on the published agenda. These instructions provide information on how to submit written comments and how to participate on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the roll call. Commissioner Bigstick. Present. Commissioner Chang Corrali is absent. Commissioner Mueller is absent. Commissioner Corzo. Present. Commissioner Rarbach. Here. Vice Chair Martin. Present. Chair Draper. Present. And alternate members, we do have Commissioner Jim O'Neill and staff is represented by Executive Officer Rob Bartoli, Management Analyst Sophia Ricaldi, and Legal Counsel Timothy Fox. And Ms. Chang Corrali did join us just in time for a roll call. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Chang Corrali? Aye. Uh, the button right Aye. Here. Thank you, Chair, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. And just in time, we'll now move on to item two, with it, which is the oath of office for our new commissioners. <laughs> the oath of office will be conducted uh, for Commissioner Chang Corelli and administered by Tim Fox, the LAFCO Legal Counsel. Good afternoon. I know this is not your first time being sworn in. Do you have a preference as to whether or not you wish to swear or affirm the oath? Swearing in is fine. Thanks. Okay, great. If you could please stand and raise your right hand. And we'll get it on screen so you can read it. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Virginia Chang Corrali. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I will take this obligation freely, that I will take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. We'll now move on to item three and open the public, uh, public comments for items not on the agenda. Uh, do we have any speakers, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will first call upon members on Zoom, followed by participants in person. But we do not have any virtual hands raised on Zoom, nor did I receive any speaker slips in the chambers. Thank you. OK, now we'll move on to item four, which is the consent calendar. And I need to let everybody know that I will be uh, requesting to pull the uh, minutes off the agenda or the consent calendar, not off the agenda, uh, as I have a small but important change that I'm going to be requesting. So if you, with, with that, uh, I'd consider a motion on everything, but uh, I would like to take uh, item B off for a question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any, I should ask, is there anybody else that wishes to take one? All right. So we have item C and D on the consent calendar, which is C is consideration of LAFCO file 23-2, proposed outside service agreement for water service in the city of Redwood City at 570 Live Oak Lane. D is consideration of LAFCO file 23-5, proposed annexation of 118 Mapachi Drive, Portola Valley. We have a motion for those two items on the consent calendar. I'll move. Okay. 
I'll second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Can you call the roll, please? Thank you, Manager. That was a, a motion by Commissioner Chancarelli and second by Commissioner Rarbeck. No. Commissioner Bixick? Aye. Commissioner Corzo? Yes. Commissioner Chancarelli? Aye. Commissioner Rarbeck? Yes. Vice Chair Martin? Aye. Chair Draper? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Your motion passes. And for the record, we we did um, Commissioner Mueller joined us, and that was the action on the consent agenda C and D, Commissioner. Okay, back to the action minutes of May 17th. This is on item 10 of your packet. And uh, it's Chair Draper closed the public comment. It's in the sort of the upper part. It says, the major financial issues have been going on and need to be corrected or the district, the way the minutes say, say will go. And I think I said either may or could, and I would like it to be changed to may. May. So should we take an action on the, the amended minutes now and then go on to the next one? Yes. yes. Okay. Is there a, um, uh, does anyone make a motion? Uh, for approving the minutes as amended uh, for the May 17th, 2023 meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Bigstick? Aye. Commissioner Chang Corelli? Aye. Commissioner Corzo? Abstain. Commissioner Mueller? Yes. Commissioner Rarbeck? Yes. Vice Chair Martin? Yes. Chair Draper? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Your motion passes. Thank you. Now we'll go on to item B, which is consideration of LAFCO file 23-01, proposed outside service agreement for sewer service in the city of San Carlos at 83 El Venata Road. I, I'm not opposed to this necessarily. I just want to know how this happened. Um, it sounds like, it seems from, from your report, Rob, that the house outgrew the the uh, septic system, and how does that happen? How does that get through planning? So this particular property at eighty three Alvanada, I would say that house is probably built in either the thirties or forties. Okay, um, it's a rather constrained site, so they might have had different regulations about when the septic system, what the what the regulations were when the septic system was created uh, for that house. That particular site as mentioned in the staff report, has a number of challenges um, for where another septic system could be located at. Nowadays, um, from my time in county planning, I recall with County Environmental Health Services, they've updated their regulations to require additional areas for where leach lines can go and backup leach lines or backup area for a new tank um, where this site would not be able to um, contain those types of backups. Uh, for septic systems. In this case, the septic system is in the front yard of the property. The, the rear of the house um, slopes dramatically upwards and is rather rocky. Um, so there is no other location for a septic site on that property. If that house was to be built today under new regulations and new on-site wastewater standards, I don't think that the septic system would probably pass uh, for those requirements. But that is one of the issues about why that sewer connection is needed. Uh, to address that public health issue. Correct, the on-site wastewater systems have a life um, span and at a certain point, they just need to be replaced or moved to another location. In this case, there is no other location on the property. The planning department was giving a, was had previously given um, new permits to people to build more yeah. And to my knowledge, yeah, to my knowledge, there has been no new development okay. on that property, and nor is there okay. new development as part of this when it is really in connection to a failed septic system. Thank you. Okay, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay, second. So, I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. Thank you. So, if I got that correctly, there's a motion by Commissioner Martin and a second by Commissioner Chang Corelli. Commissioner Big Stick? Aye. Commissioner Chang Corelli? 
Aye. Commissioner Corzo? Yes. Commissioner Mueller? Yes. Commissioner Warbeck? Yes. Vice Chair Martin? Yes. Chair Draper? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Your motion passes. Okay. Now we'll go on to item number five, which is an update on LAFCO file 22-09, uh, a proposal to establish the East Bay Palo Alto Sanitary District as a subsidiary district to the city of East Palo Alto. And it's an update on um, the status of this consideration. Uh, thank you, Chair. And so, yes, on November 10th, 2022, um, an application was received by LAFCO for a proposal submitted by the city of East Palo Alto to establish the East Palo Alto Sanitary District or EPASD as an independence, uh, which is an independent special district as a subsidiary district of the city, and that's LAPCO file 22-09. On June 15th, 2023, Cemetery LAPCO staff issued the certificate of filing, uh, stating that the application contains the required information and data as required by Cemetery LAPCO and by state law. And then there was a hearing set uh, on that proposal for July 19th at 6 p.m. at the city of East Palo Alto at their council chambers. On June 15th, uh, sorry, on July 12th of 2023, uh, the East Palo Alto Sanitary District Board adopted a resolution of intention to file an alternative proposal to the subsidiary district proposal. And that is permitted by state law. And when that um, resolution of intention to file an alternative proposal was submitted, that then triggers a 70 day waiting period, essentially, where the executive officer shall take no further action on the original proposal. So as such, LAPCO staff removed um, LAPCO file 22-9 from the agenda from today's meeting, and the notices were sent out to affected agencies, interested parties, and published on LAPCO's website with that change. Um, there will be a hearing on the original proposal and the alternative proposal uh, at a later date. We will re-notice that hearing when it is set, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions of staff at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you, commissioners. We, uh, we'll now open the public comment for item number five. Do we have any uh, comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. As a reminder for everyone on Zoom, you may press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. But Madam Chair, we do not have any virtual hands raised for this item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now close the public he uh, hearing on item five. And are there any comments that commissioners want to make? Nope. Okay, now we'll move on to item number six and the proposal of the adoption of amendment one to the Broadmoor uh, Police Protection Study. And I understand there is a presentation. Sophia, uh, please uh, provide us with some background information. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So as you all know, uh, the commission adopted the special study for the Broadmoor P Police Protection District on March 15, 2023. Prior to study adoption, staff shared the administrative and draft versions of the uh, special study report uh, with the district to get some input and feedback. Uh, staff also uh, presented the special study to the district commission, as well as to the Broad Broadmoor Property Owners Association in January. Um, after the special study was adopted by the commission in March, uh, Chief Connolly, let us know that the call for service data that was included in the special study was incorrect and shared with us um, correct uh, information or call for service data um, after the May meeting. Uh, staff made sure that this, uh, or we verified the data with the public safety, public communication safety. And uh, so the correct data, uh, call for service data is that in, Fiscal year 2022, uh, the police district uh, received about 6,700 calls for service, which means that the cost per call per service was about $400. Um, this is comparable to both Colma and CSA 1, which is unincorporated San Mateo Highlands. Um, and those two areas are sim similar in population size to the Broadmoor with under 10,000 residents. So the top three service calls is a percentage of total calls to be to the district were 
passing checks, traffic stops, and follow-ups. Passing checks were the most frequent call for service for both Colma and CSA1 and represented only 3% of the calls received by Daily City. By Daily City. Um, these changes were uh, made to the special study and they do not impact any of the determinations or recommendations that were made uh, in the special study. So the recommendation today is to accept public comment on the amendment and to approve by motion amendment one to the special study. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff at this time? Yes. Um, just because I happen to have the data in front of me and um, pardon me because I didn't think to ask this question ahead of time, but do you happen to know the population of CSA one? Uh, county service area one for those who don't see the acronyms directly in front of them. I am looking it up, but uh, it is under 10,000. Right, but you want to know the exact it, preferably. Mm -hmm. You have another question as they're looking it up. Yeah. That's my only question right now. Okay. Thank I you. I don't have a quick, I don't have a question, but I grew up in the city of San Mateo and I don't have an exact number, but it's not very many. I would say under probably even under 2000. Okay. Um, but that's like an estimate. Commissioner Merchant, do you have Thank a question? You. No. Okay. I have a few questions. Um Commissioner Martin at one of our last meetings on this topic was saying that when we got the information, she wanted to be able to compare apples to apples. And I think you were talking about definitions and making sure that things were defined. And this has been a topic of a lot of scrutiny and I started looking at it and I realized I was confused. And so my first question, and so what I'm seeing here are both calls for service and what I would call functions of a police operation and which are really not um, calls for service, but they are legitimate uh, functions of police uh, type of thing, uh, operation, excuse me. And so like passing checks, which is driving around and looking at stuff mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at um, bad checks, which is what I thought it was at the, the first time um, is, is, a, is a function. And then the same thing as uh, foot patrol on Colma is also walking around and looking at things. And so my first question is, uh, is there a definition of the different functions in police services and a, and a definition of different calls for service uh, that all the departments in San Mateo County use, or is it agency by agency. Do you know? That's something that we can look into. I know from when we reviewed the data from Broadmoor, it seemed to be similar in nature of types of calls to County Service Area 1 because they both use County Public Safety Communications Dispatching Services. So the, same, the format is the same. So there is the same types of calls. But there isn't there wasn't a definition that came along with that about what that is, but that is something that we can look into. Okay. And then as it relates to types of services, maybe you've answered part of this, but it, um, if these are only the ones that go into dispatch, because somebody could ask for a service, which is, could you speak at my organization? And that would be a, a legitimate service that police functions would, uh, I, I know in League of Women Voters, we've asked the sheriff to come and speak. And so, uh, and they come uh, or somebody representing them comes. And um, so that's a, a call for service, but that's different from help somebody's coming into my house or somebody shooting at me and which you would call into 911. So I'd like to really understand these calls for service is what type of, you know, where do they, where are you counting? Because 911 calls would be different than requests for other kinds of services that the um, that a police uh, department might do. And then it occurs to me that bigger departments have specialty divisions like um, 
homicide uh, or CSU or, you know, you special victims unit. I'm going through the TV types of things here <laughs> and detectives and um, which Broadmoor might not have. I don't, I don't know. We've never had that conversation. I will. So I'm board for um, the staff first. And um, because there are specialty services and functions, which also are um, important to policing, but not necessarily um, calls for service. So I, when I started looking at this, I thought, you know, I'm now confused. And so um, I don't know, others are, others may think it looks really clear, but uh, I just wanted to see if there were some standardization and other clarification. So, okay. We can, so we can provide some clarity okay. and then get another update. Okay. Um, and we can go back and talk to public safety communications or the sheriff's office to see yeah. if they have kind of the yeah. definition right. about that. In response really quickly to Commissioner Bixick, uh in the municipal service review or the special study for Broadmoor, uh, per the last census, there was 4,700 uh, 767 residents of County, Ser County Service Area 1. I believe it actually asked after uh, the County Service Area. Oh, I'm sorry. That was for County Service Area 1? Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? Commissioner um, Rebecca? Yeah. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. This is not to do with the uh, special study, but it has to do with attachment D that uh, Rob provided us uh called dissolution of a special district i think that's with our next it is item. okay so hold I'll that wait. idea i'll wait thank, thank you. you all right uh and now we'll open the public if there's no more questions we'll open the public hearing for public comment on this item thank you madam chair and again as a reminder you may press star nine to indicate your desire to speak on zoom and I do have one virtual hand raised from Andrea Hall. So I will call on Ms. Hall. I, I did not mean to raise my hand for this um, for this item. So I'm very sorry. No worries. Thank you. So I do have another hand raised by Ms. Taliaba Aguirre. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Christine Taliva'a Aguirre. I'm the president of the Broadmoor Property Owners Association and I was at the last meeting and had spoken at the meeting before. And um, I just wanna reiterate that the community, the majority of the community is behind the police department and police chief Mike Connolly. We are working with him in order to get um, whatever issues need to be resolved, resolved. Um, we are just getting our property owners association back up and running after being closed down for the pandemic for three years. But um, all of these calls that the police department take care of, they're making sure that when they do a drive-by there or a follow-up, they're making sure that if somebody's on vacation or away from their home for an extended period of time, they're making sure that nobody's breaking in. Um, other things that they're doing, we have a lot of seniors in our area. And so they do a lot of checkups to make sure that our seniors are safe. And we really appreciate it, everything. Um, our police chief, he shows up to all of our meetings after hours. Um, our police department, they always do drive-bys. They come in, they say hi, they check on, make sure our meetings are going fine and everything's safe. They're always there to answer questions. They always give out their numbers and their cards and say, if you need anything, please call, we're here. And when, um, if anybody in the neighboring districts, Daly City, Colma, wherever, if they need assistance with um, a police chase or something like that, our police department is there. They're, they are there to protect and serve everybody, not just our little tiny district, but everybody, regardless of where they are located. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hands raised on Zoom. We did not receive any speaker slips from anyone wishing to speak in chambers, but we did receive a written public comment from public Broadmoor resident, Andrea Hall, that was circulated to the commissioners, as well as posted to the website. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to, you, you excuse me, you didn't indicate that you wanted to speak on this item. Are you, um, and didn't put in a slip. Do I just want to check? Did you? Uh, sure, I didn't put in a slip. But as you were asking questions, the director told me the staff. Uh, those are questions that are best by sending that in the public. Okay, fine. So I can answer those questions. Not now. Thank you, though. But I'm glad that you offered. Thank you. Okay, we will now. Um, excuse me. Close the public hearing and go on to the next item, which is. Um, I'm. I'm sorry. We we close the public hearing and we need to entertain a motion as whether you want to do this amendment. And I just want to let people know that um, I am um, sort of thinking that we should pause a little bit to get some of those definitions. But I um, leave it up to the, the motion makers of the commission as to what you want to do. In other words, I would not be supporting this, this as staff has recommended. I'd be wishing us to continue it until we get further information on the definitions of what are the types of services and what is a, a legitimate call for service. Uh, I agree with the chair. Okay, is, is there a, a, I'm sorry, I see two questions. Uh, Commissioner Chang Carilli. So um, then, if we amended this further based on the information that you want, is this going to come back to us for an yes. approval? Okay, so basically we're just doing more due diligence yes. before approving something. That's yeah. what I'm, I'm yeah. suggesting. Okay, and I agree with that. Thank you. Yes. I'll move continuing the item until we have the requested information from staff. Okay, is there a second? Um, to a date certain or to be to determined? To a date certain, should we, when do you think staff? I think this could be brought back at the next LAPCO meeting. Is that it would be September 20th? And then to be brought back at uh, September 20th. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Questions? Can I just ask staff one question? Sure. So, Mr. Bartoli, you obviously authored this study, right? When you if this data had been presented in this format at the time you authored authored the study, would you have included this number in the study, or are you providing it to us amendment at the request of the district? We did have the data numbers in there. This is a correction, and so that and and that is based on information that we've had from the discussions with the district, information provided by the district, and so it is a correction. So we have an existing table that this amendment would correct with that, but then. In the discussion that we've had at previous meetings, there has been questions from the commission to provide additional context to that data. So that is where we did the breakdown of what the top three calls for service are. So that's the one big change, new additional information that's in the report. Otherwise, it is just a correction uh, to that data that was existing within the report when it was adopted. This is still not, I'm still going to ask again, though. Yeah. At the time you originally authored the report, mm -hmm. if you had had this information in this format, would you have included it? Are you simply correcting it because not because you just didn't the first time or? No, we if we would have had the data originally from Broadmoor that had the numbers of calls for service that we are amending right now, we would have included it in the report. Yes. In this format? Yes, in this format. Okay. Yeah, so it, it might... I understand my colleagues wanting to look further into this, but I'm not sure. My my only personal reservation on this is if staff would have if staff would have included it to, with us the first time in this manner, and they're providing it for correction. My question. Well, let me ask. Let me ask another question from Mr. Bartoli. In looking at the numbers from the other districts, have you done the same? You you've done the same type of scrutiny to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. We have, but if the commission would like clarity about what those apples are and definitions to them, that is something that we'd be happy to provide. Okay, but 
for the purposes of comparison, mm -hmm. you're confident that this is an apples to apples comparison with the other districts. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I, and my point is, is that passing checks is not a call for service. It is a function, but it is not a call for service. It, it and um, so, but it could be a call for service if, in fact, some agencies say, "Could you pass by my house because I'm going to be gone?" That that is. So I don't know what's in the bundle of call for services, mm -hmm. and I know I think my my police district does not do those vacation checks, mm -hmm. and so um, the and different agencies are are different, and um, and so that's just what I'm asking is is that this because if we had to act, act on it now i would say remove this data because it's there's to me a difference between a function and a call for service and i just am asking that it be defined so that we we know what it is okay well i'm i'm fine with that as a courtesy to my colleague before we vote, before we before we accept the report and its finality i do know uh this for instance the city of mental park police department does do the courtesy checks of homes uh so and so i would but i so i think other cities do do it but um but i think it's probably a good idea to go ahead and look at that so as a i'm happy to go ahead i'm happy to go ahead and 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 uh and for and well before we move forward with it get the information you're requesting that's well the last time i asked they said they don't do it anymore so um, oh really yeah <laughs> so um that's the, i think i can clarify that now. Well, I just because I would like it in writing, so that would be best if if we can have that. All right, is there? There was a motion and a second to continue to September. Um, all in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Do a roll call. Sorry. Thank you. That was a motion by Commissioner Big Stick and a seconded by Commissioner Warbeck. Commissioner Big Stick. Aye. Commissioner Chen Corrali. Aye. Commissioner Corzo, she stepped out for one second. Commissioner Mueller? Yes. Commissioner Barback? Yes. Vice Chair Martin? Yes. Chair Draper? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Your motion passes. Okay. Now we'll go on to item seven, which is an update on um, the uh, Broadmoor Police Protection District for information. Uh, staff? Thank you. So this is the 90 day update for the Broadmoor Police Protection District special study as requested by the commission upon adoption of the special study. Um, at the last meeting in May, uh, the commission requested some information about the county pool investment policy. And so the first update is to describe it and how it relates to the district. So the purpose of the county investment pool policy is to uh, safeguard investment funds and meet liquidity and investment needs of uh, county pool participants, which include public agencies like the district. Uh, all participants are required to acknowledge that it will meet the minimum balance requirement of $250,000. And in May, the county issued a memo notifying participants that any withdrawal that causes the withdrawing agency's balance to fall below $250,000 will be advised of the requirement to close that account. Given that the district has fallen be below that $250,000 threshold a few times over the past two years, there is concern that the district will fall below the threshold once again and put the district's ability to deliver police protection services at risk. Okay. Moving to the district's adopted budget. So in June, the on June 22nd, the district adopted their annual budget for FY 23-24. Um, their revenue projections for, for FY 23-24 are about $3 million, which is about a 5% a decrease compared to the prior year. And this is primarily due to uh, downward projections for property tax and and the supplemental property tax revenue. Um, although the district proposes or uh, is able to achieve some cost savings uh, by leaving two vacant op officer positions unfilled for the upcoming year, 
the budgets or the district still faces a budget deficit due to increasing premiums or uh, pension premiums, high insurance, and legal costs. Um, the FY23 24 budget did not include estimated actuals for FY22 23. As a result, it's unclear what the total impact is to the fund balance, which is their only reserve. According to the district's audit for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, the fund balance as of June, the end of June 2021 was about $1.1 million. And at the end of FY22 was about $687,000. If, and this is a big if, but if the estimated revenue, if the estimated actuals for FY23 and 24 match what was proposed in their adopted budgets for those respective years, it's possible that their fund balance, again, their only reserve, will be approximately $68,000 by the end of FY24. Once again, this concerns staff and their ability to deliver uh, police services moving forward. On June 22nd, Supervisor Canapa's office hosted a town hall meeting to give residents an opportunity to get an update on what's going on with the district and the special study and uh, discussions about dissolution. It was very well attended upward of 75, 100 attendees, and over a dozen residents uh, gave public comment, um, which uh, kind of reflected uh, the, uh, the person who gave public comment earlier, her, the, the, the sentiment that they understand the financial challenges that the district faces, but they do want to see the district remain in place. Uh, several attendees suggested perhaps increasing the supplemental parcel tax. And then there were some residents who expressed concern about the district's ability to address their financial challenges. Um, both uh, Chief Connolly and the executive LAFCO executive officer uh, made presentations and Chief Connolly agreed to work with LAFCO. Um, Supervisor Canaba intends to attend intends to hold future town hall meetings as discussions uh, continue regarding uh, the district's fiscal outlook and uh, possible dissolution continue. Uh, in early July, uh, LAFCO staff received the, the matrix, um, the completed matrix from Chief Connolly um, that that outlined their agreement or disagreement with each of the recommendations from the special, special study, their plan date for change or implementation, and their reason for non-agreement to a recommendation if that applied. Overall, uh, the district agrees with most of the recommendations, um, not all of them, but most of them, and they indicated that they've already begun to implement some of those recommendations or plan to Im implement them. Um, but there were a couple of instances where it was unclear what the timeline of, the, of, of some of those implementations would occur. So staff will continue to work with the district to stay up to date on activity. And um, once again, uh, the, the, the matrix didn't uh, change staff's concern about the fiscal outlook of, of the district. And finally, at the last May commission meeting, um, after the discussion about dissolution, uh, the commission requested a visualization of the two uh, dissolution processes that were described by the executive officer. So they're in your packet, but the one on the left describes the, the process for a typical dissolution process that can be initiated by LAFCO or a special uh, the affected district or an outside agency. And the one on the right outlines the process for um, uh, dissolution initiated by LAFCO using SB 938. Uh, and it describes kind of the activities that need to happen um, and the 12 month uh, review period before uh, moving forward with dissolution. And that is my update. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that we have some commission questions. So Commissioner Rarebeck. Uh, I'm appreciative of the uh, information that uh, uh, Rob provided about uh, 
the process for dissolution. Uh, I'm unclear as to uh, some of these uh, steps, and I'd appreciate some clarification. Uh, in particular, what is a protest hearing? Uh, how is it noticed? Uh, who can attend? Um, that's, that's my first question. We can pull, pull up this, there we go. So after a commission's decision on really any item that does not have either 100% consent uh, from the property owners or from the applicant, uh, there is a requirement for LAFCO to conduct a protest hearing. We typically do not have them in this county because we don't have actions that usually do not have 100% consent, uh, but there is a requirement in those cases to have protests. So if on a uh, an action, let's say a dissolution where the commission uh, approves dissolution of a district, there then is a requirement to hold protest. And the protest hearing uh, has to be set within 35 days of the commission's decision. And then the protest hearing can be up to 60 days uh, in most cases for when that hearing would actually be. Protest is by, um, has been done in person by either handing in written protest or by mailing in a protest. The protest comes from the registered voters or landowners within the affected area. So if in the case of a dissolution of a district is those that reside and are registered voters within the district or that own land within the district. There are depending on uh, the a number of uh, inhabitants of the area, if there's 12 or more registered voters and it's an inhabited uh, process that we're going through. In those cases, there are various thresholds then about how much protest would be required. That comes off of 25% of the registered voters within the area or 25% of those owning 25% of the land value, of the assessed value within the protest area. Those calculations are done at the protest, at, at the conclusion of the protest hearing. So protests can be submitted any time from when the notice goes out that there will be a protest hearing up to 60 days, which when the protest hearing is set. And at the protest hearing, they can submit protest as well. It's then calculated uh, either at the protest hearing or later depending on whether or not there's sufficient protest. If there is sufficient protest, uh, if it's greater than 25% protest and less than 50%, then it goes to an election, again, of the, of the district residents and registered voters, you'd say. If it's greater than 50% protest, it actually terminates the proceedings. So in cases for protest hearings, that notice uh, can either be by mailing out to registered voters that notice and landowners or publishing it in a newspaper. That's widely circulated. We, get, we, we in the last 23 years, I think we've held three protest hearings that I can recall, three or four. Uh, th thank you very much, that's helpful. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. So um, I have two questions, and uh, I it's my style to ask just clarifying questions to make sure I'm very solid on points that I think I read. And um, it seemed like in the staff report, given the projection of the hemorrhage of the reserves, what it looks like is when they get to creating the year 24-25 budget, which presumably would be a year from now. Um, they apparently would not have the reserves to cover expenses. Is that more or less staff's understanding? Uh, no, but if, 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 their, if their actuals are the same as what was in their adopted budgets, they'll be fine for the next fiscal year. It's after that fiscal year, assuming that everything is exactly as proposed. So I'm, I'm not suggesting 23-24 won't be all right. I'm suggesting 24-25 won't be all right. It depends, I guess. It, 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 will, it, will, it, dep depends. it will depend on what the actuals are, but you are 
if it is sixty-eight thousand dollars, if that if those two budgets are actualized, and the fund mounts to sixty-eight thousand dollars, from what we have seen with prior year budgets, and the draw on the fund balances for those years, mm -hmm. it would be unlikely then if it's the same amount, uh, unless there's dramatic cuts, then that would be a, a a big challenge for the district then to overcome because we have seen the fund we have seen budgets be unbalanced in the you know around two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. And if the reliance has been there, that the fund balance has been adequate to do that. If it drops to sixty-eight thousand dollars, that same practice uh, would seem very challenging to continue, and and it'd probably be a financial issue at a certain point. And so it's um, kind of looking at two things simultaneously, right? It's um, what is probably going to happen against you know where are we now and where we are now is a place that may or may not be in flux to a point. And it may be in flux to a point where what seems to be a probability may not come to pass. But I want to understand that we're in a place where a probability may not come to pass, but we are looking at a probability. Okay. And then the um, other question is, are they currently in the county pool? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I want to thank you first off for responding, uh, responding to the uh, to the report uh, with your responses. I think the big primary concern uh, that we have, at least I I don't want to speak for the whole board, but the, one of the primary concerns is providing the uh, the right amount of information transparently to the residents in Broadmoor, uh, so that they can make a decision what they want to do. And so having that response is helpful to that. The question I have for um, Mr. Bartoli is, uh, it might be a question for Mr. Fox is, so we have a check now in place uh, with uh, with the county or and if you drop if the district drops below the $250,000 they drop out of the pool. And that's, that's great uh, for uh, the immediate term. But the question that arises for me is that after let's imagine that it drops out of the district drops out of the pool. And then at that point, uh, the district ends up going bankrupt. Um, while we've protected short-term obligations, my question is what happens to with respect to the pension obligations and the continuing obligations of the district. And I think I've asked that before, and I just wanted to confirm to make sure that there've been some research into that and that those obligations do indeed re remain with the homeowners of the Broadmoor district. Is that correct? So I'll... I'll respond first in the context probably of LAFCO law, um, you know, in because we are in the situation where you can have something occur financially to the district before a commission action comes forward, such as a dissolution of the district. In the case of a dissolution of a district, um, the a, a district is solely within the unincorporated area of the county. The county becomes the successor agency. They may also become the provider of service, depending on what that service is. However, any liabilities uh, that that district incurred, the district potentially remains as an entity for those liabilities. So it would be that the liabilities of pension or other obligations would remain to be paid for by the residents of that former district. So the district is not dissolved completely until those obligations are wound up if for LAFCO purposes. All right. And the same is true if LAFCO does not move to the dissolve the district, but it goes bankrupt. In that circumstance, those liabilities still remain within the district and the residents of the district. Yes, the, the special district continues to exist as the holder of liabilities toward the people to whom they owe um, various money such as pensions. Um, I think the distinction that Mr. Bartoli is making is that the county is in backup position to this special district in particular only because uh, it is the provider of police services up by default. Um, we don't like to say of last resort because you know obviously mm -hmm. the, the sheriff is the law enforcement agency for the entire county. Um, so we know that we are backup provider for services but we don't stand essentially as a guarantor of liabilities that are incurred by special districts in the county's jurisdiction. Um, those are vested in the, the special district itself. And I think what Mr. Bartoli was, was hinting around is that um, 
special districts are susceptible to proposals for reorganization, whether they're initiated by LAFCO or by uh, persons who live in the Broadmoor district or other public agencies that um, see a need to propose some kind of reorganization. And there are procedures by which a proposal for reorganization can provide for various successors to be responsible for various things, including administration of those liabilities. But generally speaking, it's the tax revenue represented by the tax increment in that district that is supposed to back up the obligations that the district has financially. So yeah. in the case where an agency goes bankrupt, but continues to exist, that liability still remains with that entity because that entity still exists. In the case of dissolving an agency, the county becomes a successor, both probably for services and also for winding up the affairs of the district. The district still remains technically in the, in the entity to capture property tax from that to pay for liability. So that way, in those cases, if there's pension obligations that may need to be paid, they are not spread out to county residents. They remain solely by, need to be paid by the residents of that former district. Okay. I, but I guess I'm so my confusion is the, is the distinction without a difference because if the district goes bankrupt, or the is it, the county would still be in a situation where we would be the successor, would we not, or would there be some ent other entity? Not necessarily, but a proposal could be made that the county would be the successor. You could also create another agency that would wind up the affairs. But I think the important uh, distinction is that it's not the county general fund that would then be paid toward, it would be the tax increment that's already being collected for Broadmoor right. that would just live on in perpetuity until all the obligations were extinguished. Right. So there'd have to be essentially, this isn't the correct term, but a trustee that would just continue to meet those obligations as they get extinguished over time. Right. And the reason why I raised that is because I think it's really important for the residents of Broadmoor to understand that if they do pursue a parcel, a supplement parcel tax, that's adding to the continuing obligations upon which that they would they would uh, be pulled from to go ahead and pay for those pension liabilities over time. And so it's something to really, uh, while people are thinking about they're trying to save the district, it's something for them to be thinking about as well in terms of what the obligations are that they're adding on to it if the district can't get healthy. And so, um, but I, may I move to comments? My comment? On this, I think we I, we're right now at questions. Okay, I'll I'll hold my comment. Then. I would like to open it up to the public, and then we'll we'll close the public hearing and then go comments. Thank you. If that's all right with you. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions at this time? Okay. And uh, so, if you we would open the public hearing and see if there's both in person and Zoom uh, people who wish to comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. We can give it a few seconds for members of the public to queue up, but at the moment, we do not have any virtual hands raised for okay. item seven, neither on Zoom nor in chambers. Thank you. Okay. Oh, here's one hand from member, public member Andrea Hall. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Hall. Hey, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I just had a question. Um, why, um, what would be some reasons why LAFCO would not undertake a municipal services review right now? And at what points in the future would it consider undertaking a municipal services review? That's the extent of my question. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Hall. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hands raised for item seven. All right. Um, all right, now we will go on to uh, commission comments and Mr. Miller, thank you. Thank you. So as I, I'm not sure where my colleagues are on this, but as I've looked at it, I actually believe uh, it doesn't, given when you look at these flow charts, you end up in a protest hearing in every circumstance. And so given that we have the $250,000 um, safety check in place, and given that the district uh, has complied with their responses and there seems to be public sentiment to try to give them time to put their affairs in order, um, 
I actually am, am at this point not moving toward dissolution, but rather trying to provide as much information to the residents of Broadmoor as possible so they can make the decision of whether or not they want to move forward with the supplemental parcel tax or whether or not they want to go ahead and realize that without it, bankruptcy may be heading toward them. So, but either way, I think this is, is be given the financial direction of the district, this is coming to an end without, without the intervention of our board, but for to provide the necessary information for the residents to make a decision. I um, agree with Commissioner Mueller, and I'm actually hoping that you know you that the district will kind of work to take into consideration these um, recommendations from um, or in the, from the the LAFCO study, and I, I'm looking at the the one that talks about accountability structure and efficiencies and the district disagrees with the recommendations to adopt the annual GAN limit appropriation limit resolutions and reduce reliance on excess ERAF for district operation and maintenance. And so being on a special district that has to deal with the GAN limit, which is the Menlo Park Fire Protection District, I mean, we actually do um, vote on that. And at least for the two special district boards that I'm on, you know, we're not looking at ERAF as a continuing thing, um, continuing source of funding just because of the nature of ERAF. And so I just, I'm hoping that the district um, will look at some of these things that it disagrees with, including that one part, because I think it is good governance. And um, just from a transparency standpoint that Ray, Ray brought up, I, I think that's very important. And quite frankly, I think it can give you an honest picture of where you are financially so you can actually do more long-term financial planning uh, because I think the pension liabilities, I think, what is it, like 437,000-ish on a $3 million budget. Is that, I, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong on that. But anyway, it's, it's a lot vis-a-vis -vis the budget you know, that you get a picture, an honest picture, and that the residents get an honest picture. Um, also, well, there are just a couple of things that the district disagreed with, but I do think that this transparency issue with regard to the finances and the GAN limits and reduced reliance on excess ERAF is something that um, the committee or the commission should be looking at. Um, first, a question, uh, presumably from LAFCO attorney, uh, on the GAN appropriation limits. What exactly are the legalities around requiring that? Are they not required to have that in place? I believe the state of play is that the district is being advised by its legal counsel that it has a plausible argument that it is not subject to the GAN limit. And I don't know that any county agency has necessarily um, uh, been in a position where it could definitively disagree with that. It is a matter of internal governance uh, to some degree. Um, maybe there are other county officials or agencies that have to take it into account, but I know that the district has been asserting for a while that it has an argument that the GAN limit doesn't apply to it. And I have not undertaken to understand um, the merits of that argument. So I appreciate um, you elucidating those nuances for me, given that my core agency that I work for as a member of a city board, um, we clearly have that in place. And so it's yearly routine. So, so um, as I go through this matrix, and first of all, thank you for having filled this out. This the effort made and having this information directly in front of us, it paints such a more vibrant picture of what we're looking at. Um, the many comments about terrors around finances notwithstanding, to have this picture, then it's okay, now we can see what maybe needs to be done with something or what is being done with something. And that's really helpful. So thank you for that. Um, and having been a member of several boards at this point in my time serving in certain directions. Um, I'm gonna start with just a couple, what I hope are helpful critiques and then 
you know, end on a positive note. Um, it would be great to see more specifics in this and not merely for our sake, but for your communities, especially in those places where there's agreement. It would be great to start seeing a plan being fleshed out. And I, at this point, we've had so many meetings, I'm not quite sure what information we get in the next round, but to say that for the sake of your community, if they see what the plan is, they'll start having some reassurances, I would imagine. And especially if those plans start panning out. So it's, you know, the future is out of focus, right? Um, there was one bit in there about uh, wanting suggestions for creating staff reports without expenses. Um, given that we're talking about budget stuff a lot, that was a tough sentence for me personally to read only because I work with so many agencies and it takes money to create a staff report. So I just wanted to kind of gently nudge that back in your general direction. And then the other one that kind of made me pause was the idea that ERAF seems to be reliable and that most agencies are, I think the Fraser is relying on something like it, but I feel like the implication was ERAF is a stable place. And I'll tell you, I began any kind of service with a core agency of the county, a nonprofit. And it became apparent to us as the city was debating whether or not um, the agency I was then on the board of should be funded. The answer was, well, we're not sure if we're going to keep ERAF around, but instead of keeping them in the general fund where we have them, let's stick them in ERAF. And then if that should ever change, we'll change the conversation, which to my agency at the time, my nonprofit was horrifying. And B, especially with um, finances, agency finances being what they've been lately and looking at the state budget. Every time a deficit looms, the likes of which we've been seeing on the state level lately, um, at least in my city, we get to swallow hard and say, yes, we should continue our regular practice of planning as though this might not be around next week. And so appreciating that it's a considerable chunk of revenue for the time being, and that it's hard to conceive perhaps of not having that near at hand. If nothing else, it's a worthwhile conversation to have. And if right now the answer is we need that, we need to rely on that, fine. But then can we think just a little bit further in terms of could there be a day when we don't necessarily need to rely on it? Because at least for my agency, and it would hurt if we did not have that coming in, it's imperative that every year we're planning as though nonetheless it might not. And that's again, just coming from trying to work with the budgets that I, so, and I said, I wanted to end on a ha happy note and I, that you're investing in, um, in audio and video recording to place on the website, actively working on transparency, thank you. And the idea that you're gonna have quarterly financial reports coming out. I feel like that's going to um, make our conversations less, um, you know, we're somehow looking down on you for not having the information or we're trying to call you out. No, we'll have the information there and we'll all be uh, able to converse in the same data sheets. And that alone will make for a much more fruitful discussion, I would hope. So all of this um, notwithstanding, thank you for having given us the fuller picture. And I'll stop there. On this side, Commissioner Martin, any comments? Um, I agree with everything that has been said. Um, I kind of focused in on the uh, Brown Act um, requirement. And you say that your insurance company provides that training. Uh, I think you can probably get it for free from California Special District Association and uh, just things like that, working with other organizations to see what they're doing. Uh, again, I think you know that I sit on the mosquito board, and these are the kinds of comments that we got uh, when we had the problems that we had to shore up what we were doing. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. 
uh, with his remarks with regard to ERAF. We almost lost it last year. I mean, it was almost history. And we do not use um, it as part of, of what we consider our income. Okay, okay. that's all I have to say. Of course. Thank you. Um, my comments will be brief as I'm an alternate and this is my first meeting. So I'm coming into a, a, an ongoing discussion as someone with um, some fresh uh, eyes and perspective. Um, yeah, I, I will say um, it's actually very concerning to me, um, just even this whole list and you know, being new as part of the conversation. Um, It seems like there's been a lot of progress made, but but you know, can I can I actually just ask for a, a, some clarification? Where are we in this process? Because I'm like totally new here. So I'm un I understand that we are talking about this dissolution flow chart, but I'm not understanding where we are. Where are we right before? No, we're not. On. We're not on we're it not at all. This uh, we did a special study. Yes. And uh, as a result of that special study, uh, there was a lot of um, conditions, mm -hmm. not condition, but recommendations. And that's, um, and so at one of our last meetings, the commission wanted to know how did Broadmoor um, think about those, um, those recommendations. And so that's what's in the chart. And then one of the options because we looked at options, should there, you know, looking at all options, one was dissolution, which got people very excited. And, and also many of us didn't quite know what were the steps just from an informational purpose. So it was requested that we have a, a flow chart to say, well, what, what does it look like? So we've taken absolutely no action to do either of these. It's just for information. So what the commission as a whole said is, we think this next year, so we're part of that next year, um, should monitor the progress uh, that the Broadmoor community is doing. Because at the time, and I think we're still there, we felt that the Broadmoor community really needed to be to learn about all the, the problems and work heavily with the chief and with the elected officials there to solve these serious financial problems. So that's sort of where we are, is this sort of getting information and and um, and holding public meetings and uh, seeing how progress is being made. Thank you. So we have not conducted an MSR. We have not because we've not gotten to a point where to date that um, it, it should, <clears throat> that we've not triggered it and it's not on our work program for I this see. next fiscal year. Okay, well, I'll just say that um, I'm all for working with the community and educating them on what's going on, but I'm also, just from what I understand about the what has led to the concerns, the many, many, many concerns around Broadmoor Police that they're, like, I'm also, I'm just surprised that um, we're still having conversations about it and not actually taking action. Um, so I'll just, end my comments there and say that, um, you know, it's important to educate people, but also it sounds from what I understand and what I've read up on, on, you know, Broadmoor PD, there's been very serious concerns that have been 100% uh, true and have led to legal action and many different things. And um, so I just want to voice that. Thank you. Mr. Rubik, comments? As I've said before, the, this is not the first rodeo for this uh, uh, district. If this has been going on for a decade. The finances are really worrying to me. And if the uh, district goes bankrupt, then the citizens are going to be deprived of important police services. So I'm very concerned about the the finances uh, and even the uh, the budget that has been approved uh, indicates that in two years, they're not going to have any reserves. 
Um, and uh, if the economy uh, goes south, it's going to get even worse. So I'm very concerned about the future of this district. Uh, and uh, we need to really monitor that they're uh, going to uh, correct these uh, inadequacies uh, soon. And I'm not sure that there's a real serious program to correct that. And I think the citizens of Broadmoor need to be uh, apprised of what's going on and uh, realize, as uh, Ray just said, that they may be on the hook for uh, the debts that the uh, district might encounter if it goes under. So this is important and uh, it's concerning to me. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm gonna go back here and go through again and then I'll make the final comments. Yes, go ahead, please. So I wanna just piggyback on Commissioner Martin's comment about CSDA being used as a resource because I think it's, it's really important. And again, thank y'all for um, doing, just filling this out. I think it gives us a clearer picture, but I also think that there are resources at CSDA that are are free, including, you know, things about the importance of a reserve policy for special districts, for example, and and um, you know maybe how to start one, you know, things like that, pension liabilities, all of those types of uh, financial issues. So I'm just kind of throwing this out there that maybe y'all look at CSDA as as a as a resource to see what kind of um, solutions or offerings they might have to the 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 well maybe but they can they might be able to point you in other areas to for your board to look at and for staff to look at but I think you should rely on not totally rely on that but you know, look and see what benefits y'all or not. But again, thank you for doing all of this. I think, I hope it helps the district as well as LAFCO. Thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Martin. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, where are we going now? So where the commission decided, probably I think two meetings ago, was to, and we have a schedule of monitoring. And so this is, we'll be back in September, I believe. September, correct. Um, to, and at that time, there'll be more information on the actual closing. Uh, so we will have that information. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean the fiscal year. So we'll have, we'll, we'll continue to look at this over the next year. And so th that's where we are. We're just in a, a monitoring, seeing what's going on because we, felt that it was very serious and that we needed to keep our attention on the issue. I, I ask because I agree with Harvey that this has been an issue as long as I've been in government in this county, uh, unfortunately, Lord Broadwalk. Okay. Uh, and I think that's my final comments is I want to thank you again for being here today and for the work that you've done. And um, I noted in the budget that you didn't fund two police positions or two, two and a half. And I'm sure that's very hard to do. Uh, it's a, a big percentage of your workforce, but it was a, a major step. And I'm, I'm wishing the community luck. And, uh, and I really mean that. And working through these very tough and challenging uh, issues that are before uh, the, the police district. And so uh, I think we'll continue on with this, but again, I wanna thank the community too. And I think the speaker that was here from the community um, that they are there, because there are a lot of very talented people in this area. And I really think there's, there's resources and thoughts that they have that uh, can help solve these problems, but we need to keep our our we need to keep on this and understand where where things are. So that ends this item, and I thank everybody. Um, and they will close uh, this item and go on to uh, item eight. Thank you.
Okay, we'll now move on to item eight, which is Cal LAFCO, and we'll begin item 8A, which is the annual conference, which is information only. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so registration for the Cal LAFCO annual conference for 2023 is now open. Uh, the conference will be held in Monterey, California from October 18th to the 20th. Uh, so far, Commissioners uh, Chair Draper, Commissioner Big Stick and Commissioner Chen Karali have expressed interest in attending. If you have, if anyone else is interested, please let me know soon, uh, probably by the end of this week, or if you can let me know at this meeting uh, after it concludes, um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. And that is item 8A. If anyone has comments, I will move on to item 8, item A, B. And that is as part of the conference, uh, elections will be held for the Cal LAPCO Board of Directors. Uh, so each LAPCO is entitled to one vote for the board uh, at the elections and the business meetings before the membership. And the Cal LAPCO bylaws require that member LAPCOs designate uh, their delegate in writing um, prior to the annual meeting. Uh, delegates may be a commissioner or the executive officer. Uh, so in previous years, the executive officer has been selected as the alternative uh, in case the um, events that the designated commissioner or the alternative commissioner are not able to participate in the election. And in years where the chair has attended the conference, the chair has been designated as the voting delegate and other members have been the alternates. So there's a recommendation um, from staff to appoint a voting delegate and alternative delegates to the California LAPCO Association Conference for 2023. Well, I'm going to be there so I'll, I can be the, the voter if you would like. Well, I'll, I'll make that motion to have you be the voting delegate. All right. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. All right. Roll we'll call, please. We'll be there. <laughs> Commissioner Big Stick? Aye. Commissioner Chang Corrali? Aye. Commissioner Corzo? Yes. Commissioner Mueller? Yes. Commissioner Rarbach? Yes. Vice Chair Martin? Yes. Chair Draper. Yes. Thank yes. you, Chair. Your motion and passed. Chair, if I may, is there a desire to have an other alternate commissioner besides the executive officer be uh, designated to vote for the members that are attending? If so, the commission can appoint the alternative as well, uh, and we can write that down in the motion. Well, I would recommend uh, Commissioner Big Stick as, uh, to be the alternate. I'll if second he's that. okay with that. All right. Absolutely. Uh, second. Right. And we'll incorporate that into the motion if that's all right with everybody. Please. All right. We need to move on to number nine. Pardon me, Madam Chair. We do have to open public comment. Okay. There is oh. nobody wishing to speak. But all righty. Just have to open. All right. Thank you. That's so I'll close this public meeting, public hearing, I should say. And we'll go on to item nine, which is the legislative report, which is information only. So currently, uh, CalAFCO is tracking 21 bills. Uh, there are just a few updates to some bills that we've uh, presented to the commission in the past year. Uh, SB 360 would allow members or employees of JPAs and LAFCOs to be added to the list of entities that can sit on the California Coastal Commission. SB 360 passed in both the Assembly and the Senate and is awaiting the governor's signature. AB 1753 is the CalAFCO omnibus bill. It makes minor changes to the Cortese Knox Hertzberg Act and was signed into law on June 29. Uh, these, the changes that were made in that bill were to allow the executive officer to submit resolutions adopted by the commission either by mail or electronic electronically, as long as there is a confirmation of receipt by the intended recipient. The second change clarified some language that any agreements for property tax exchange required in accordance with state law must be received by LAFCO prior to the executive officer deeming an application complete. Those are the updates. Any questions? Seeing none? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, Commissioner Martin. Any progress on Zoom meetings, essentially. There doesn't seem to be one. One of these was actually taken off calendar, I think. We have been um, tracking a couple of bills that were in that area. Um, they have not made a lot of progress. 
um, they generally tend to get loaded up uh, and made more specific by um, smaller constituencies. So for example, there was an extremely promising bill that made it look like um, certain um, uh, advisory agencies would be entitled to vote online if they could make findings that doing so would enlarge public participation instead of constrain it. And it got changed into a bill that would apply only to municipal advisory commissions of the city of Los Angeles. So um, things like that are happening in the legislature. Unfortunately, there does not seem to be a groundswell of support for the notion that online meeting platforms are superior to in-person meetings. Um, for whatever reason, that just does not seem to be um, cat catching fire uh, in, in the legislature. It's unfortunate because, you know, I sit on a 21 person board and we had perfect attendance through the entire pandemic. <laughs> We have we have certainly received feedback from the folks who volunteer and serve on advisory commissions at the county level that um, their commitment to service is very strong, but that um, they find it extremely difficult to meet in person under current circumstances, uh, whatever they may be, and that their volunteerism and the, the breadth of the people who could participate in governance and um, decision making would be broadened by allowing more flexible rules. And um, I believe our, our county manager, county executives, um, legislative uh, um, analyst um, um, advocate uh, has, has made that message clear to our legislative delegation that um, for, there is that voice in the community that, that people want to participate in governance by um, participating in more online meetings. But again, as we said, there appear to be some very strong um, interests uh, that are more um, persuasive uh, to the legislators in Sacramento. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll now open for public comment. Are there any public comments on item nine? Thank you, Madam Chair. We did not get any speaker slips from anyone wishing to speak in chambers. And we do not have any virtual hands raised for item nine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then we'll close that public comment period for number item nine. And we'll go on to 10, which is any commissioner staff reports information only? Anybody? Seeing none, we will now, uh, do we need to open the public comment on this? I guess we do. There's. Yes, and we, uh, again, we did not receive any speaker slips for item 10, nor do we have any virtual hands raised okay. on Zoom. And item 11 is uh, adjournment at uh, 352. Thank you. Yes.